uh, book, uh, first uh, Flying Saucer Review, he said that none of the Mothman reports had had arms, but they they changed and evolved almost as if Keel's personality really evolved the field. So I'm very kind of cautious today about how Keel changed and he's <clears throat> taken along with him a lot of people that are followers in almost a cult-like way. And I call it Keel's spawn. <laughs> and it's a very <laughs> negative, very sinister. His appendix on his tour, the 2001 tour edition of his Mothman Prophecies, is one of the most caustic appendix that I've ever seen written by a writer talking about how other writers had quoted him or, you know, uh, cited him. Keel was not a happy man towards the end of his life, and that very much was reflected in a lot of things that he did with other people, a lot of things that he wrote, and how he kind of really cut himself off, and it it really, uh, you can I kind of understand how he ended up very alone uh, when he died. Uh, yeah. And it's very sad to see that have happened. But um, his, his sort of sinister nature of his writing, reflected of his personality, really became part of his personality in a very damaging way that I've talked to many people this week, and they all felt, you know, cut off from him. His family was cut off. He, he would tell other writers, don't contact me. He would tell all of us, don't send him any fan mail, you know, and all of that. And, and, and it was just very sad to see at the end of his life. Indeed. Um, I, reading your um, entry about that, uh, it was very moving and disturbing, and yet, uh, as you say, it, it almost has a certain uh, logical ring to it. Um, in, in fact, in the movie Mothman Prophecies, where they've more or less split his character into the two characters played by Richard Gere and the uh, actual demonologist character uh, played by the actor whose name eludes me at the moment, but... Um, um, Alan Bates. And he... The uh, Stephen Misrak's review was to, reminding me of how the the director was able to kind of explore the different sides of of Keel's uh, investigative aspect versus his you know kind of paranoid aspect of seeing things in demonological terms. Um, I I certainly it, it's a spooky book and uh, and I and I think I've I've kind of had that flavor um, uh, in running through his other works and. To, to to some degree, it it strikes me as there's a, a little bit of that quality in most Fortians, and and uh, um, certainly Charles Fort's idea of humanity as property uh, is kind of uh, provocative and makes one think that the phenomena is is kind of how to get us. So, um, I guess I I I hope that he wasn't at the, at the you know the last. Uh, Part of his life, um, really feeling too much angst towards other people, even at the time that we know he was um, pushing people away to arm's length at the very least. You know, I think some folks really appreciate folks giving them space and they need to go through what they got to go through. But this uh, is PSYOP Radio. We'll uh, talk about this a little more on the last segment here on the other side of these messages. Stay with us. If you want to survive, Look to the earth and not the sky if you want to survive. That was one of the main messages, uh, in a sense, uh, from John Keel, is that these, mes these, these beings, these entities from elsewhere, whatever they are, they lie. Uh, he often referenced Swedenborg, and uh, this was uh, an idea that many a researcher has pointed out that across the annals of history where human hum humanity has found itself in contact with these alien others, um, <laughs> their messages uh, and prophecies aren't always to be believed. And uh, um, we've got Lauren Coleman on the line, and we've been discussing the life and work of John Alva Keel, who just passed away this July 3rd, 2009. And um, I think um, I'd, uh, one of the things I wanted to read was uh, from uh, my good friend Stephen Misrak, who I mentioned earlier. He uh, has written a tribute. I can't read the whole thing right now, but he uh, talks about the concurrences between uh, Valet and and uh, um, John Keel in terms of their uh, 
talking about the the phenomena might be ultra terrestrial and not necessarily uh, extraterrestrial. That the phenomena has historical roots deeper than 1947. That the phenomena seem to respond to people's beliefs, and that's uh, uh, he always Keel always cautioned people that belief is the enemy. And uh, four, that one should be cautious of the ufological establishment. Um, and five, that the phenomena was part of something that could be considered a control system, whereas Belay seems to think of it as more positive. Uh, Keel tended to think of it as negative. And as uh, um, Lauren was just saying, uh, this seemed to find its way into the after effects of these phenomena, uh, contact and effects on other people um, in the creation of uh, folks who are a little, perhaps a little too uh, into John Keel. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Coleman? Well, I think that if you want to be a good Fordian, you should be skeptical of everything. Yes. All writers, you know, myself included. And uh, and yet you find swirling around the Mothman, death curses, bad luck, light bulbs exploding, phone troubles, and I don't know if that's from Keel's personality or from the Mothman phenomena in and of itself, but it's certainly, of all of the ones, it's, it's one of the strangest that has a lot of sinister bad luck connected to it. Indeed. Um, well... I hope you don't have to drive home tonight. Please. No. <laughs> Thankfully, no. Um, I am sitting yeah. at home as we speak. Um, yeah, I... And I know that that's, that's something that you've um, uh, uh, chronicled a lot is is mysterious deaths, uh, and not just in the paranormal field, but in the, the parapolitical field as well. Um, right. And Keel, you know, I don't wouldn't ever really characterize him as a conspiracy theorist, uh, but as a paranoid, yeah, he definitely saw uh, that there were powers and principalities running the world, and uh, in some of his lectures was often referencing... Uh, the people who uh, you know start wars over oil and that sort of thing. Um, did you? Oh, ever... he was a, a very interested in the crypto political, and he would talk about this on and on. Uh, you know, talking about assassinations and the JFK assassination really interested him and Grassy Knoll and all of those things. He didn't write that much about it, but he certainly would. You know, keep you up late at night uh, at conferences in the you know the waiting room of the hotel or or whatever, just talking on and on about a lot of his. Uh, and I, I believe you know, being from New York and being in Greenwich Village, he had a lot of friends that were connected to a lot of people that were very political. So he brought some of that into his his own way of looking at the world. Of course, sure, taking in all the data points and constructing a, a map of reality. Um, you know, in in the Mothman prophecies, there's a lot uh, made in the scenes dealing with the the, the female characters' dream premonitions of the disaster that would befall uh, Point Pleasant in the form of the bridge collapse. And I, it just occurs to me to ask: uh, Did do you ever talk about dreams uh, with much with uh, Mr. Keel? Did he ever was he the kind of person who would, uh, in a letter or uh, in a conversation, tell you about his his personal dreams? Absolutely not. I, I don't remember anything about that. I know that you're referencing Mary Hyde and her dreams about the the Christmas packages floating in the water. Exactly, yes. She had, they really were the precursors to the bridge collapsing. But I really, I remember, you know, Keel going on and on about creatures and, and spook lights and names and, and different things like that. He, he really didn't talk even as much about 